Hey everybody, it's Dr. Gallus with Restore SD Plastic Surgery. I'm ready to do another round of carpals and cannulas with Dr. Greer, who should be joining me shortly. And tonight we're going to talk about breast implant revision surgery. So super excited about that. So there she is, because I think we both do a fair amount of this. Um, and as soon as she requests, I will get her on. Go live. I feel like I have super weird lighting this evening, but that's fine. Hey. Hey, how are you? I'm good. It feels like it's been forever since I just saw you in person, even though it was like a couple weeks ago, right? Well, it's been like a month. Has oh. it? it was yeah, it's it been it has like two weeks. Flashlight. It was on. Yeah, I mean, it's been at least a month because we had ASPS at the end of last month, and now we're halfway through November. So like two weeks. <laughs> well, the meeting was two weeks ago. Yeah, that's when yeah. I Yeah, and then it was like a week before that, so maybe three weeks. Okay. Not so, so long. <laughs> it seems like it was time ago, but whatever. Yeah, and it was good to see you. I know, it's good, good to see you early. as well. <laughs> and like a hundred other amazing women plastic surgeons. Yeah, it was a good time. I'm just actually watching some of the on-demand stuff now, or not on-demand, but some of the stuff that was recorded. Because I felt like I ran around the whole time and then didn't get to go to every lecture or thing that I wanted to go to. Yes. Although it was funny, like the things that I remember, like Ashley Amalfi's Tegaderm bra. So my mm -hmm. scrub tech today, she's like, Dr. Hannock across the hall is doing the craziest thing. He's using this Ioban as like a bra. I'm like, yeah, I know where he learned it. I was at that lecture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I might use that actually. Just have to find the right patient for it. Yeah. And I met one of those patients today, honestly. Um, so we were going to talk about breast implant revision. Yeah. On topic. So is, um, I mean, we both do a ton of breast surgery and revisions happening eventually yes so um yeah so i was think i thought about it for her she's not exactly sure what she wants to do anyway hey dr Snita. um but um <clears throat> for people who just need she just needs like a she had an augmentation like several years ago in a different state and one nipple is a little bit lower than the other one she didn't have a lift at the time and one of our concerns is that asymmetry. And you could do, if you, I said, you could just do the lift. You could just reposition the nipple under local, honestly. And yeah. Be, but then she has, <laughs> hey, um, she has saline implants, which um, she just doesn't like. So that's another decision factor. Um, right. She doesn't like um, the way she can feel them laterally. And she can kind of feel like it's a, Ziploc bag full of water kind of sensation and it's ripply. So, you know, if you're going to do that, then you're changing out the implants. Maybe you could, you know, resupport the implant and then tegaderm the nipple up because it really only needs to go like a centimeter. So, yeah, I actually have a primary out coming up where one nipple is a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. and that might be a nice option. Right. To just release them both off the muscle a little bit. So when you're releasing, so you got the pec muscle, you got the breast tissue, you release the breast tissue off the muscle and then tape it up a little bit higher with the tegaderm bra and it stays up a little bit higher. That actually might be a really nice option for her. Yeah. Because uh, sometimes it is really the one side and do you really want to put an incision on one side? Right. Happen? We talked about that. I was like, I don't want to make an incision on one side and it's really obvious compared mm -hmm. to the other. That might be a really good option, actually. I'll just have to warn her, hey, you're going to have plastic tape on you for three weeks. It'll be I know. I'm here for it because it's winter. But yeah, it is kind of odd to wear a plastic, basically saran wrap bra for three weeks. Whatever. So okay, well, um, when I figured we can narrow it down by talking about people who have implants in, but want and want implants back in, yes. like not out permanently. So, you know, sometimes people aren't sure what they want to do. And then that's a totally different conversation. But if you have implants, then um, the easiest people are people who have implants in, there's nothing wrong with their implants. It's just been 10 years. And I tell them, 
Wait, yeah. bye. Yeah, it's like, you're good. <laughs> it's not like an oil change, guys. You don't hit your 10,000 miles and your air filter has to be changed. It's, yeah. well, and now we have high resolution ultrasound in the office, which I think was a game changer because I would always tell patients, you know, if you have saline, you're going to know if they deflate because it will shrink with silicone. You don't really know. And then do we want to order an MRI that gets kind of expensive? But now we all are starting to get ultrasound in the office so we can just take a peek at your implants and tell if they're yeah. intact. Yes, but if they're not bothering you and there's nothing going on with them, then absolutely, maybe don't mess with them. That would yeah. be- uh, Come back in three years. That's the easiest. Then I have people who, like you were saying, saline implants. That's probably the most common reason for implant revision with saline implants is rupture, right? Mm -hmm. They automatically know there's a problem because their whole implant deflates and so you have one flat breast and one that's not um do you see a lot of those or i do i see a ton of those in hi amanda who waits to us um yeah where they'll come in and one side's really asymmetric and it's the most annoying thing ever because you have to stuff one side of your bra all the time so i love deflating that other side in the office and then at least they're symmetric while we're waiting to do things. Although I've had one or two patients decline that and say thanks, they'll stick with the padding. Yeah, I've had patients just hang out like that until they just get on the surgery schedule sooner rather than later. Right. Um, just because, you know, nobody wants to walk around with one deflated breast. So I tell my patients about, I would say about 50% of my um, saline patients when they have a deflated saline implant, that's why they're having another surgery they stick with saline because they know how it feels and they're good with it. And then the other 50% switched to silicone because the reason they got saline was when they had it put in, they were either too young or um, it was during a time where you couldn't get silicone implants. Right. Oh, Actually, okay. silicone implants weren't available until the end of my residency. I mean, I want to say it was like the fourth year. They were back on the market for cosmetic, not just reconstructive. And the, the temporary hiatus was just because we wanted more data Mm -hmm. um, it, there weren't any actual problems or increased risks with silicone compared to saline, but they've been back on the market for cosmetics now for a good 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, and those are definitely the implants I use most. They feel the nicest. They're the softest. Right. So I do tell them, you know, you have the option to switch to silicone if you want. If you don't, you can stay with saline because you know what you've got. Um, but most primary people who are just getting an augmentation for the first time are doing silicone. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to tell you guys, if you are coming in for a consultation about your current implants and you bring in your implant ID yeah. card, you get like a super extra gold star in my book. I'm always super yeah. impressed when people have that thing. They're like, it's 20 years old, but it tells me the exact style of implants, how full they are, what size. It makes a huge difference. Although I will say, I think plastic surgeons get pretty good at guessing implant size. Like we could work at a carnival be a really screwed up carnival but like, we, get, <laughs> we get pretty good you know I've definitely guessed right on the nose or within range many times yeah I think the times I've guessed wildly incorrectly is when the patient is so confident but doesn't have proof so I've he had people tell me oh yes I absolutely have 500 cc implants in and then you get in there and you're like wait these are 250 like how did you, how were you so wrong? I had somebody <laughs> begged me to deflate her saline implants and she had silicone in there. And I was like, mm, yeah, these aren't going to deflate. Yeah. So how are you so confident that you have something in there that's not there without proof? And I've learned to take that as a, you know, I just say, okay, well, that's your best guess. I've had people with their implants placed in other countries um, like, oh, it's the CSI of trying to figure out what's in there. It is. And then there's always the whole textured versus not textured. And the reason this is important, guys, is because of breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma, BIALCL. It has been happening so far as we know, only in people who have had textured implants at some point in time. So if we know they're textured and they're above the muscle where it's easy to take out the entire capsule. We like to do that because we think it's probably preventative. If they're under the muscle, it's a lot harder to get that capsule off the ribs without doing damage. But then at least we know what to warn you for. But then sometimes we'll go in and it's like, oh, I didn't realize these were textured. We didn't talk about capsulectomy. Right. 
I've had that happen. I just tell them, listen, if we really don't have any idea what's in there and I, they're textured, I'm going to try to get the whole capsule out, which again, as you point out, is so much easier if they're subglandular implants. However, I would say over time, subglandular implants, at least as from what I've seen, don't hold up as well, like tend to fall with the, imp with the breast tissue. Like they just... Yeah come down. Yeah, and the submuscular sometimes just stay in the breast and tissue. And the breast tissue falls off. Yeah. It's but always we, kind of an adventure seeing what's in there. Yeah. So I recently, let's see, last week I took out implants that were completely ruptured, like so ruptured I cut it. I mean, they were placed in the 90s, so not a surprise. But grade one capsules, like very thin, you know. Parting it out. Yeah. I got it all out, but the capsule was thin, and then the implant was just barely any shell like completely yeah. gone so those are always tough and you know those have had to have been ruptured for a while but sometimes when they rupture you get a capsular contracture or you get you know calcifications and they have coconuts like what rock yeah, hard like so rock you know, hard. but um not always so it's always an adventure still don't even know what was in there because there was no way to even weigh it it was just straight Goo. mess yeah yeah implants get really gooey at the older generation ones the silicone was less highly cross-linked so more like honey the newer ones it's a cohesive gel but leave those in for 20 years and they may soften up we're not really sure um yeah it's it's fun and the capsule you guys it's the scar tissue around the implant it can be anywhere from a couple cells thick where it's like trying to dissect up tissue paper to like a nice thick leathery capsule which is much easier to get out Right. Absolutely. So yeah, so I have, let's say, what would you say your most common reason is for women to come in for implant exchange? Like, can I, I would say it's more, it's changes in their breast over time. So okay. often they had implants before they had kids and then afterward things either dropped or they've gained weight or their bodies changed so the implants are too big for their frame. So mm -hmm. it's usually just that things have changed over time. Once in a while, they know that things are ruptured. Yeah, I would say too that the saline patients almost always it's a rupture, but my silicone patients generally it's a size change, or they know they need a lift, so they want to change, tweak something. They, right. the, the implants have been in for a long time, so if you're going to do a lift, just exchange them and have a fresh start there and maybe go up or down a little bit in size. And yeah. I think it depends how old the implants are. Honestly, I feel like 20 year old implants tend to run in the 250 CC range, at least in Southern California, 10 years ago, they're more likely to be 400 CCs, 500 CCs. It's all trend. Yeah. And then I think it's, swing you know the pendulum swinging to for smaller implants again but you know there's always outliers so yep and I've had a couple patients I had exactly two who came in and they were like I just thought they would be bigger and higher <laughs> that's always a hard one guys because bigger means heavier which means gravity yes yeah so that's usually when I'll bring in the big guns and use Galaflex to support right and I was just talking to somebody about that today because it was her implants are mostly fine, so kind of trying to tease out what she wants, if anything, right now, because she's also fairly, if you had your implants placed, let's say, in your 20s, and now in your late 30s, you might not want to mess with them, because you're going to likely need to do it again. Um, right. So you better have a, like, a really be able to tell me what it is you want changed. And it started to boil into having the implants sit higher. And I'm like, well, they are submuscular and they kind of are where they are. So you're looking at using some sort of internal support to prop them up as much as possible. And that's... Which, okay. It does help. It does help <laughs> a bit. It gets them a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, holds it up there. But yeah, it's that's a... Sometimes... So again, I try to explain to patients, and I'm sure you do too, you're putting the implants, you're kind of centering them behind the breast, at least where the breast... <laughs> Could be, yeah. But I don't know who came up with the idea of a footprint for a breast, but... Well, I mean, I guess 
it's just where the breast is attached to the chest wall. It doesn't always stay there. It gets kind right. of long. But, you know, so if you lift the breast up, there's a crease at the top, guys. And then everybody's got the crease at the bottom, the inframammary fold. In between those two is the footprint of the breast. And it stays ideally within that footprint short of things like raising the whole footprint of the breast by removing some tissue off the inframammary fold. Then we get into some more complex techniques. But... Yeah, or lowering the fold. Yeah. So I've seen the lowering of the fold. Um, I think, yeah, when we start messing with a footprint, you start adding a whole other um, level of complexity to the breast. And sometimes you can do that, but a lot of times you don't want to. I would say the most common um, request is to have your breasts closer together, right? So yes. that's cleavage. But where you, if you, push you don't want that you because, actually don't want that if you push your breast medially so towards the center of your chest you can kind of see where it's attached to your chest wall and it really the implant should not go past that if it does your breast will slide out and your nipples will be paced going in out facing outwards so we don't want that you definitely don't want your chest to connect in the center, see right. that. the mastia, because you've got to have the pectoralis muscle insertion is what keeps those implants separated. And if you try to go more medial than that, you end up with one continuous pocket, which is not awesome. You've probably seen it on botched. Yes. It's like those jog bras that have no separation. You're just one big breast, uniboob. Nobody wants that. So yeah, so you have to make some sacrifices. You have to kind of appreciate what you can do with your own native breast. I tell them that you do get an appearance of cleavage because you're increasing the volume of here, but we're right. not. But you still need a push up bra if you want that super tight. Yeah. Up, up and up and up. Yes. yes. And then, you know, women often want a higher upper pull, which mm -hmm. with implants, that's what happens. The implant goes above the upper pull and it raises it. But if you're just doing a lift, the upper pull doesn't go any higher. So I think women don't, there's like a little bit of a misconception about what the result's going to look like without adding an implant, adding fat, adding mesh. Yes, I agree. So I've seen that when people think they just want to lift and they kind of shove, like, I just want to lift and shove everything up. Yeah, you're, it's more like picking it up. <laughs> you're like raising it a little bit, but you're not shoving up upper pole fullness. And definitely an implant will, if you want that upper pole, that upper half of your breast to be kind of full, um, you need a, you need an implant almost always. You can, yeah. you can do a little bit with fat. Definitely depends on how much fat you have, how much breast tissue you have. Um, but it'll still look more natural than that rounded. I call it an orange County look cause Southern California, but yeah, if you want people to know that you have implants, then that's definitely a higher, more projecting implant. Yeah. And I do have people who want to do that too. If you want to go up in size, but you don't need, you don't want an implant that's like now way out here, you can change profiles. But then again, it helps to know what you have in there first. Right. And if you don't know, it, it doesn't help at all. And then after a certain size, they're all high profile anyway. I mean, really after about 285 or so, most people don't have a super wide chest to accommodate that size. So you're high profile after that. Yeah, you're definitely so and then that means um, what we're talking about is how much the implants going to add to how much you stick out from your chest wall. So how much you're projecting, um, which is, you know, one of the nice aspects of having an implant is that you have more projection and more kind of upper fullness. So great if you want to wear a strapless dress, you want to wear, you know, a bikini without support. A lot of women tell me they like implants because then they don't have to wear a bra, which is, you know, cool, I guess. Theoretically, but don't do it all the time because those implants are heavy and the tissue stretches. Yes, true, true. And then lately I've had a run of people, um, a run of people that have been like, I don't know what bra I wear. I feel like people have stopped, they're wearing bralettes or jog bras or camisoles. And they're like, yeah, we're trying to drill down to like a 34 C is, is become less, I don't know. It's less universal, at least yeah. in my patient population. Somebody's I'm, I'm, 
loving the comment there, if I could, but I think because it's your TikTok, I can't. But yes, they do. And congrats. And I'm excited for you. I, you know, that actually reminds me of because I just did this technique. I do this technique all the time. So if you do a lift, often we take out a little wedge of tissue over the inferior pole. But with people who want to maintain volume, we can take that tissue and kind of tuck it up over the upper pole. And that does add a little bit of upper pole fullness. Right. Without mesh and without an implant. I call it an auto augmentation. What is it? Ribeiro technique? I yeah. Think. Yeah. Ribeiro. Yeah. Probably pronouncing that wrong. Yes. I think that's helpful. I definitely don't like, if you are trying to maintain as much volume as possible, I start, you know, I feel like we're queens of not throwing anything away. So. <laughs> yes. We save it. We just rearrange it and tuck it up and it looks pretty good. Yeah. Definitely. So, Okay. What do you do when um, someone comes in and you know they have ruptured implants? Do you do anything different or? Um, well, ruptured silicone implants are very messy. Actually, the very first time I operated at the surgery center I do all my cases at, I took out ruptured implants and it got so gooey. They had to strip the floors and re-wax them because the floors were slippery. Silicone is slippery, guys. And it, may, it gets all over the instruments. It gets all over your gloves. So I always make sure that we have clindamycin on hand, although mm -hmm. there's been a shortage nationwide, which has been a little tough because um, that will wash out. And then I always try to do a capsulectomy if I can so it's not right. all over the place, but... Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think it's helpful to know if it's ruptured so that you can be prepared. Um, but sometimes you, you know, you're not going to know it's a surprise when the implants aren't very old. It's usually kind of surprising. I've done um, best uh, ruptured implant unprepared was somebody I was taking them out under local. Um, so that was fun. But again, right. it was a newer implant, so they tend not to be as honey-like inside and more like gummy mm -hmm. bear, so much easier to- Yeah, make. actually the last surprise rupture I took out, we only knew it was ruptured because there was an air bubble in the implant. And it, oh, took, me, yeah. it took me a couple minutes of squeezing the implant, looking really closely, and there was one little pinhole rupture that let the air in, but otherwise you wouldn't have known. Yes, I've seen that as well. So that's good if you can um, you know, get that out and put a new implant in and kind of move along. I've done that for sure. If you know it's ruptured, it shows up ruptured on mammogram or whatnot. And so then it's time to do the exchange. And it's also important to know that the implant companies will replace the implants um, if you let them know. So you have to ship them back in and improve that they're ruptured. There's some paperwork we fill out, but they'll at least cover the cost of the replaced implants. Yes. So and that's the warranty that comes with all implants, all of the device manufacturers have them. I think they're usually up to about 10 years. And after that, the rupture rate goes up, so the warranties. Uh, most of them warranty now for are the they longer now? Yeah. Oh, really? Are they longer now? Yeah. They used to be. Okay, so clearly so Dr. Gallus reads the literature on her implants <laughs> way more than I do. I feel like I had to do an update talk for ASPS one a couple years ago. But yeah, they'll, they'll warranty for the life of the implant. For capsular contracture, your cutoff is 10 years. So I just saw somebody that was nine years in, had her current CapCon. I can't remember where she had had it done, but I was like, you can, you know, you can go see multiple people, try to figure out what it is you want to do, but um, just make sure you get in under that 10 year window. Otherwise the right. companies aren't going to budge on that. And so. of course, the implant company has to still be in existence. I've taken out a lot of McGann implants, which aren't right. And yes. then I, think the, I took out Dow Corning implants once. Those were right. old. Those are very old. I've seen those. Those are fun. Yep. So there's a lot. What is Inamed still on the market, or is that the ideal? No, Inamed. No, Inamed was uh, became McGann, then Inamed, then Allergan. Okay. Yeah. So it's like then you got to track down. The warranty program and you got to have your info yeah it's, so it's yeah. complicated so i think it's just the newer implants that have that kind of warranty i've had people who had uh, ruptured implants that were part of studies but they like no longer like contract that so they just have yeah. to cost that's yeah. why you should save your card just up <laughs> public save service your card and and also when we educate people it's like right on the information sheet this is cosmetic future surgeries are cosmetic they're not covered by insurance you're gonna have to pay out of pocket and the cost is usually the same or a little bit more than your primary aug right right yeah you have to mentally prepare for that 
Yeah, because it's not generally any shorter of a surgery. Often it's more involved. You have to pay for new implants, so it's all the same costs. Yeah. Yeah. I tell people the most common reasons for implant exchange is size change or rupture or Capcom. Those are the three most common listed. And it's not, there's no time limit on any of that. But the longer you have the implants, the longer one of those things is going to pop up. Exactly. So. And then once in a great while, I'll have an early revision, either because an implant didn't drop in a place enough or dropped a little bit too far. Right. And that happens right. once every couple of years where I'll go back in and just either release a little bit of the capsule or tack the inframammary fold up a little bit. Right. Yeah. Just to correct that little bit of asymmetry. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So implants in a nutshell. Well, I actually had a request in my DM, so maybe we can do it next time to talk about um, gynecomastia surgery. Wow. Yeah. We have not had a discussion about that. Have oh, we? my gosh. I think one of my staff members' daughters got engaged because my texts are blowing up if you keep hearing the ding. I just saw oh. like, a picture with a hand like this. So I think that's what happened. That's um, awesome. Super yeah. exciting. Cool. Yeah. Let's talk about gynecomastia. That will be super Perfect. I did a yep. lot of that in the military. And let's see, that'll be, two weeks will be Cyber Monday, right? Yeah. Yes. It'll be right after Thanksgiving, right? Yes. Okay. Thanksgiving's next week. Oh, my gosh. I know. I am so not ready. I'm trying to say hi to everybody. I know. Um, all right. Cool. Well, I think that wraps it up. If you have implants and you're concerned about them, go see your board certified plastic surgeon to find out what needs to happen next. Yep. And if we didn't do your implants, we're still really happy to see you for a consultation, do an ultrasound, tell you if everything looks good or if you're ready for a revision. Yep. Sounds good. All right. Have a good night. You too. Okay. All right. See ya.